prayer. O Holy Spirit of God, take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our ears and open them. And set our hearts on fire with love for thee, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Two weeks ago, when I gave my last sermon, I preached on 1 Kings chapter 8. If you were here, you remember the story about Solomon and how he had built the temple first, putting God first, and then built the palace secondarily for man, for humankind. And what happened with Solomon and his reputation of being wise is that he really wasn't very wise because he bankrupted the kingdom with all the money he spent on the palace. And with a thousand concubines he had, he brought in other religions that diluted the Yahwistic religion given at Mount Sinai to Moses. We talked about the temple and the palace, and the palaces of our lives, money, pride, addiction, fame, not really money, the love of money, position, power. We talked about the dance between the temple and the palace that we do in life. We talked about the dance between the sacred and the secular. So I want to, to talk about that for just a moment, but I want to pause and ask you a, another question, a very important question. How many of you do Facebook? Okay, how about, how many of you don't do Facebook? Okay, that's a lot more than I thought. Okay, well, I, uh, I like started Facebook about nine years ago. I put it off for a while, and then friends were like, you're missing out on the world, and I was able to reconnect with some college fraternity brothers and friends from high school on Facebook, which is a really, really wonderful thing. And there's a, a page on Facebook that, I'm, that, I, that I follow. It's called, What Kind of Snake Is This in Texas? Has anybody seen that page? Okay. Now, uh, I live near some woods and grapevine, and my neighbor Judy called me over one day and said, I've got some snakes in my house. Can you come over? And, and, and I'm, a, I'm a city boy from Dallas, and I said, well, well what now? <laughs> and, and I said, uh, so yeah, well, I need you to come over. I got, I got a little snake in the garage. I got, I got one in the bathroom, and I got one on my windowsill of the dining room. And I walked in, and I said, those are copperheads. I mean, I, I, I'm from Dallas, but I know a copperhead when I see copperhead. I said, do you want me to call the animal control? She goes, oh, I'm a West Texas girl. She took her butcher knife and just chopped off its head. <laughs> So I learned on this Facebook page that the idea of, when a lot of people put these pictures, they ask, is it a poisonous or non-poisonous snake? Because obviously you need to know, right? Yeah. In case you get bit. So I, I realized later that's not the right lingo. It's, is it venomous or non-venomous? So I learned something. Venomous or non-venomous? And I want to I talk about that in the context of human behavior. I want us to think maybe venomous could also be akin to toxic, or non-venomous being non-toxic. And we all probably know at least someone in life, or maybe people think that we might be toxic, or venomous, in how we live our lives. So I want to think about that, again, that, that dance between the secular and the sacred, and, and when our things and our personality goes south, if you will, to toxicity. Although I hate it with that phrase going south, because I live in the south. We'll say when it goes north. How about that? <laughs> right? So one of the ways that we can learn and, and, and how to continue to live that dance and living closer to the sacred than the secular, closer to the temple than the palace, is what we have in our scripture today. If you look in your first reading from Proverbs, which is a great, great book of wisdom, full of wisdom. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. Whoever sows injustice will reap calamity. The rod of anger will fall. Fail. 
Those who are generous are blessed, for they share their bread with the poor. And we are blessed, aren't we, in the first world? We also see in Psalm 125, the first verse is about how we are in relation with God. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but stands fast forever. The second verse, the Lord, the hills stand about Jerusalem, so does the Lord stand about his people from this time forth forevermore. So there's a two-way dialogue, one way in the first verse, another way in the second verse, if you will. And then we have verse four, show your goodness, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are true of heart. True of heart when we recognize when we, we get too palacy and we have to go back to the to the temple or too much in the sacred and we have to return to the Lord as people, which we will do, every one of us, each of us will do that to the very last breath we take because we're human and that's part of life, right? Is that dance, always doing that dance. And so then of course today in our epistle reading that we heard read from uh, the book of James, letter of James, we hear about how we are talking about the notion of mercy and judgment. And that Shema from the, from the ancient Hebrew in Deuteronomy, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And when it comes down to it, as many funerals as I've done, and maybe as many of you have been to, that's really what it's about, right? It's our faith in Christ and how we live out those Ten Commandments. Loving God, loving our neighbor. And what is that? The heart. The true heart. Verse 4 of the psalm. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Fifth line down from the bottom of the letter in the epistle. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And Jesus showed mercy to the deaf man, and this is our picture today, of course, as we try to put a little art history on the front of the cover. And Jesus showed mercy to the man who could not hear, and he cured him and healed him. And we too, my friends, must show mercy, always. A lot of times it has to begin with ourselves. And we're also called to not to be deaf to the pains of the world. And to remember that as we do this dance in our life every day. Now, I want to I want to share with you uh, about this this little book I've been reading. It's called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. Has anybody read this? They have it? Okay. So you can read it in an afternoon. It's not very complex or complicated. But the four agreements. The first agreement is to be impeccable with your word. Well, well, we just saw that in the first part of Proverbs, right? A good name, etc. Be impeccable with your word. Number two, the second agreement, don't take anything personally. Now that's hard to do. I don't know about you, but that's hard to do because we have feelings. We get our feelings hurt. Right? People know how to just, just push those buttons, right? You might be sitting next to someone who just knows how to push those buttons. The third agreement, don't make assumptions. We never know what anyone's going through in life why they do the things they do, whatever's going on inside of them, the stuff of the palaceness of the world that in, infects us sometimes and causes us to act out. And number uh, four, always do your best. Now I want to talk about this for a second. I want to talk about the one about sometimes where we make assumptions, and I'm going to tell you a story. And uh, it's a story of, of my family and uh, so I was born in Dallas, lived some in Columbus, Ohio when I was a kid in Detroit, Michigan, and came back to Dallas, Texas in uh, high school in 19... <clears throat> 1981, 1981. And, 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 and my mother always would have these great big Thanksgiving dinners, and, and she learned to cook from her own mother's uh, cook that she had for 26 years. And, and she learned all the great Southern cooking. All the reasons I'm on Lipitor today, butter and salt and butter and more butter and all kinds of grease and fat and all that makes it all taste so good. 
<laughs> and all the kids would come to our house, Mr. Combs would invite us to dinner. And, we, and so the, some of the parents didn't really care for my mom because they were always leaving and coming to our house for dinner when we were growing up. <laughs> But we always had Thanksgiving dinner with our relatives who were here in Dallas, and some relatives would come from out of state. My father was from Huntington, West Virginia, and my mom from Dallas, so we'd always have a big crew. And I don't know, if you are uh, kind of like my mom, you probably spend days preparing of what you're going to have, and you might start cooking on Tuesday, you know, and then, of course, all day Wednesday and Thursday morning. And sometimes you got to call 1-800-BUTTERBALL to get a little help, right? Anybody do that? <laughs> get a little advice. So, um, as we always did, we had Thanksgiving dinner, and, and, and my aunt and their family came over, and, um, and so uh, my mom spent hours and hours, and we would help her, and we'd, you know, cut the green beans and get everything ready, and, and, and I don't mean store-bought pies, I mean... The rolling pin. And bread. The rolling pin. Not the little crescent rolls that Mrs. Pillsbury or whatever it's called makes, right? And so one day mom's like, I gotta, I gotta have a little break from this. So, uh, so my aunt brought uh, a package of dinner rolls that she bought at the store. And then while they were waiting and we were getting ready about to eat, my, my aunt asked my mother a question. And uh, I could tell my mom was kind of like, Excuse me? And, 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 you know, and then my aunt kind of went to the living room and my mother was not in a good mood, I could tell. So I went over and I was like, what's going on? What was that about? Oh, no, don't, that's no, okay. Don't worry. Just make sure the table's set, you know, get, get the wine glasses and all that. I could tell it's the bother and I was like, what? What's going on? Well, your aunt asked me, if I have warmed the dinner plates. <laughs> if I have warmed the dinner plates before we are to eat. And I said, you mean the lady that brought the rolls and brought nothing else asked you that? <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I see how this is gonna go. I see how this is gonna go. So, um, so she kind of got over that. She was kind of disturbed about that. Then the next year, when we had it again, my aunt walked in the door with her portable dinner tray uh, warming oven thing that she stick in the... And my mother was like... Seriously? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> again, did not bring any dishes to share, didn't it? You know, did the same dinner rolls. Okay, those are wonderful dinner rolls. But nothing else. And we had never, ever been invited to their house for a meal, ever. So my mother was a little bit fit to be tied, as you can imagine, as a strong Texas woman. <laughs> and, uh, and so she made a judgment, as any of us would do. Anybody ever had that happen to you at Thanksgiving dinner? Anything like that? I'm going to hear the stories at the end, after. <laughs> I promise it won't go on Facebook. <laughs> So she had a judgment, and, and, and it kind of bothered her it, for a long, long time. As it might, might imagine, coming into my home as my guest, telling me that I need to warm up the plates, that I'm not doing it according to your specifications, that you don't need to bring food and never buy me your house forever, you know, on and on and on. It could be like a snowball, right? Mm -hmm. So one day I was talking to my mom as I got a little bit older about that incident. And I thought about that story in today's in the epistle of mercy triumphs over judgment. You know, sometimes we never know what's going on with somebody. Like, we're like icebergs. You see 20% 20, 20 of us outside the water, and there's a whole lot of other stuff underneath that water. We have no idea what's going on down inside with somebody, and a lot of folks themselves don't know what's going on inside. And I said, I said to my mom, I said, you know, I wonder... I wonder if, if Aunt so-and-so is feels intimidated by your cooking because it's so awesome. Because she grew up in an era in Leave It to Beaver where you had a, you cooked when you did and you had a good home and you were known by that. And how she might feel less than as a woman of that era. And what that must feel like for her inside. 
And then I said, I wonder also with some issues that my cousin had, what she might feel like with the perfect Macomas children, which we were not, trust me. <laughs> but that she might feel less than as a mother. And the pain under the surface of that iceberg of what's going on inside. And when we had that conversation, my mother then began to, to open the door of mercy and close the door of judgment. To say, maybe you're right. Maybe that is painful for her. Maybe that affects her self-esteem or her notion of who she is as a human being. Now, did my mother stop cooking off some food? Absolutely not. But she was able to, to, to see a new perspective that we all can do when we sometimes go to the door of judgment, quick to do as we do as people. Rightly so. It takes work to open that door of mercy. It takes work to step outside of ourselves to say, wait a minute, maybe something's going on under the surface that I don't know about. Maybe there's some pain, some insecurity, some fear. So our little book, this book here, tells us to try to not take it personally if we can. Don't make assumptions and always do our best. <clears throat> but that's not easy. I bet you have a Thanksgiving story. I bet there's somebody in your life right now that maybe there's a memory that you went to judgment so quickly, and rightly so, but maybe that, that you know, that's just eating you up inside. That was eating my mom up inside. My aunt, she, she didn't know, I had no idea what was going on inside. Right? So that affected her. And yet, when we can move or ask God to help us move through the Holy Spirit to that place of judgment into the place of mercy, then we can be healed. Like a friend on the cover of this bulletin. We can remember about what it really means to love our neighbor. Of course, we also need to love ourselves. So I'm going to ask you to do a little homework this week. This is one of those sermons that gets beyond meddling. <laughs> to think of somebody right now in your life where you may have this Thanksgiving example, or you may have the, the aunt in your life, or whatever, sister-in-law to my mother, and how you could think about a way to have some mercy, open the door of mercy, or if, if the door is too big, maybe a window. Maybe a little crack. And to let God's light pour in on that. Because when we go around in the world with all that anxiety and junk inside, it just eats us up. Right? We can ask this guy on the cross to help us. Take that away. Because we don't need to have all that stuff going on. God can release us from that stuff. But it's a little, it takes a little work, doesn't it? It's a little bit of homework. It might be going into an uncomfortable area. And even if that person is no longer alive, you might be able to have a conversation. I was at the grave of my father the other day in Dallas. I went to a funeral at St. Luke's, and I went over to Dr. Sparkman Hillcrest, where my father's buried, who died of a brain aneurysm at age 54 in 1989. And went to his grave, and we had a conversation. And uh, he was an alcoholic for most of his life, or, or for the large part of the latter part of his life, and was, was from Huntington, West Virginia, as I said, who was dirt poor. And so, as you might know, with the 12-step program, you stop the, the behavior, and then you step back and you look at what's underneath and what may be causing that behavior. The, the, the pain that he had or the insecurity, you know, of trying to make it in the world of going into the, the Navy at 17 to get the GI Bill and serve in the Korean War so we could go to college and get out of poverty, as so many of our family members have done. And to think about what might be infecting us or impacting us, in either example, my mother or father, 
and to allow that sense of love and acceptance of God for my father who was able to then toward the last few years of his life get sober and to begin examining that stuff that was going on in his life from his childhood. And we all have stuff from our childhood. No parent is perfect. No upbringing is perfect. We may have some resentments, some anger, but God can take that from you if you open that door of mercy. And I guarantee you that meal or that taste of mercy will be better to you than any Thanksgiving meal, except for my mom's. <laughs> Amen. Amen.